It's not enough to go off the electric grid or be ready to simply survive disasters and societal calamity. We need to change our entire way of thinking and living. We need to go beyond off-grid. To understand more about our dependence on the grid and how to escape from it, we need to review some history and gain a proper perspective on the times in which we live. Rome, one of the most storied and studied civilizations of all time. Starting out as a republic, Rome became an increasingly powerful and militaristic empire. But over time, the Roman Empire grew decadent and weak, culminating in the dismantling of the empire and the fall of Rome itself. What caused this fall? Did Rome's war-making and tyrannical government sow the seeds for its own demise? Did Rome's debasement of its currency and lack of morality contribute to its decline? And did its increasing dependency and reliance on just-in-time provisioning of goods almost guarantee its fall? And what does this history of Rome tell us about the future of America? Everyone has heard of the Caesars and the influence of the Roman Empire on Western civilization. But most don't realize that ancient Rome does more than just cast an influence on modern America. Modern America is very much like ancient Rome in many ways. Ancient Rome uh, was remarkably similar to a modern urban, urban life. Um, they had er everything from running water to uh, air conditioning. They had uh, aqueducts that were very famous in Rome that brought in cool water from up to 21 miles away. Almost everything you can think of in a modern city, uh, ancient Rome had. America began before the Industrial Age, and the colonists who founded it established an agrarian-based economy and society which was locally focused. The American War for Independence was only a cooperative effort of multiple states because they needed to pool their resources in order to defeat the British Army, which was at that time the world's most powerful. This agrarian nature of economy and polity was the strength of the nation which when coupled with the abundant natural resources present, made America the most productive agricultural economy the world has ever seen. As the Industrial Revolution took off, the powerful corporations that arose to form the foundation of the new industrial economy grew their influence over the economy through their size and ability to influence local and national politics. They also changed the makeup of the American economy and labor force. These industries needed workers, but the vast majority of the population was largely self-sufficient farmers, a vast middle class of productive households. They did not have need for many of the new industrial goods, yet through a combination of appealing to people's greed, first for greater income through the use of machines for farming and other work, to their desire for comfort and status during a time of rural electrification, the rural farming population moved away from their self-sufficient means of production and toward a life of dependence on manufactured goods and electricity. The change in the American economy goes beyond the makeup of the labor force and purchasing patterns of the population. Even before industrialization, America struggled for economic liberty over the issue of money and credit, and who should control it. The vast majority of the founding fathers were against a central bank. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation, and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The Roman ruling elite debased their currency and cheated their citizens by reducing the amount of precious metal in its coins. Similarly, the United States has for over 100 years allowed the private banking cartel known as the Federal Reserve to manipulate the money supply and debase the dollar, or more appropriately, Federal Reserve notes. Suppose I had the power to grant to you to create a million dollars out of thin air. Suppose I took off the million dollar limit. Where are you going to stop? You're not going to stop anywhere. Now further think about this. The person who has the power to create money out of thin air eventually will own everything in the economy, right? I mean, logically, he's creating the money. The other people are not. And so he can buy everything eventually, which means that you're going to have an increasing concentration of wealth, which is what we've seen. In addition to that, he's going to be able to buy all the politicians he wants. 
What that means is that banking and the state become one symbiotic creature. One fascist creature is really the technically the correct economic term. This inflation of the money supply is a form of theft from everyone who is saving money, as their purchasing power is reduced relative to the new larger money supply. The new money goes first to the banks and the corporations that surround them, just as Jefferson described. The 2008 financial crisis showed plainly that the banks are in control of government economic policy. With more and more American jobs being outsourced overseas and declining real incomes, most families are struggling to make ends meet, and they're often doing it using debt, while the mass of the population grows in their dependence on debt and government assistance to get by. Overall, we are no longer a productive people and a producing nation. You have uh, people like ourselves who only own a few acres, and uh, people would say, well, you have the same incentive as someone else, uh, as a rich person to buy large tracts of land. Well, since we are poor, we don't have the ability to do that. We actually buy land because we want to make it productive, because we want to build buildings on it, because we want to build smokehouses and ice houses, and we want to have barns. Well, what happens with an ad valorem tax is every time you improve that property, your taxes go up. So there's actually a de-incentive for production. This ought to tell you that your society, the, the, the society that's out there in the world today, the economy and culture of this world, is designed to de-emphasize production. It's designed to keep us in slavery, to cause us to go as consumers with their, our bowl in our hand and to beg our bread. Beyond the centralization of the economy in the hands of the very wealthy, this centralized system has become increasingly unstable and prone to crisis and even collapse. If you or I go out and loan money to Joe Blow, loaning $10,000, and Joe is a well-known dolt who likes to smoke dope, and he goes and spends the $10,000 on dope, I'm just out my $10,000, and I don't loan any more money to dope smokers. But the banks, no. If they loan $100,000, $300,000 to a dope smoker, and it goes bad, the government bails them out. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to loan money like there's no tomorrow because that's how they make money, because their bonuses are based on that performance. But this is part of the overall game plan of the elite, to consolidate wealth and power that leads to a crisis, then offer their solution to the crisis, more control for them and less liberty for the people. What will a continued long economic depression result in? What does history teach us will happen? The situation will get so bad, the economy will get so bad, that people will listen to anybody who claims he has a solution. It doesn't have to be a workable solution. He just has to keep repeating that solution loudly enough and long enough that they believe that it will work. I mean, that's, that's the way Adolf Hitler came to power. That's, you know, that's the way the communists came to power. They, they kept repeating these false solutions long enough, loudly enough, insistently enough that people believe them. I think the United States is ripe for that kind of thing.